Damn. All right, we got report number two today. Uh, Branson? Up there. And Branson, what are you doing? Report. What? Oh, oh, I'm 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 fixing our taco machine. Oh, for the love of John Har, you Branson, we have a working taco machine. But it didn't make quesadillas. Branson, I want quesadillas. Branson. What? On the Shiro base, the taco machine works. Yeah. Up on the in the in the station, it doesn't. Well, I want a working taco machine somewhere. Well, I I, I just thought maybe if I could add the quesadilla option. I mean, I, by the way, I couldn't make this part fit back. It's spare, right? It's not vitally necessary, right? Dallas, Branson, Dallas, Dallas, please don't kill me. Put that part down. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm okay. going to ask Haro to fix this. Okay. And between Haro and Glix, we'll have a quesadilla button for you, okay? Okay. okay. All right. Good. Go get ready for the report. Okay. I'm going to go now. In 1979, Mobile Suit Gundam was introduced to the world. But what is Gundam? Where do you start watching it? Join the crew of Shiro Base as they seek to discover Gundam together. Come and join the Gundam Watch. Hello Gundam fans and those who might soon be Gundam fans, welcome to the Gundam Watch, the podcast where both seasoned veterans and newbies sit down as we discover Gundam together. My name is Branson and I am here with my longtime buddy, fellow co-host and all-around partner in crime, Dallas Mora. How are you? I'm doing well, Branson. I'm doing very well. I'm happy to have a working taco machine today. How yeah. are you today, Branson? I'm 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 good now that the taco machine's fixed and you don't want to kill me. I, you know, I'm it, it took there aren't an broken. army of horrors to fix that. Let's not jack with that. Okay, okay. That lesson learned. I, I'll be content with my tacos. That'll be okay. But anyhow, we are here to watch Gundam, discuss it, and uh bring some perspective to it. For those of you who don't know, Dallas is the resident. He won't call himself an expert, but I can because I'll say it. He is the resident expert on all things Gundam. I'm the newbie. I'm here to bring a fresh perspective because up until last episode, I had seen absolutely nothing of Gundam. And we are gathered here today to now that's discuss. That's not true, Branson. You have seen a commercial. Okay, yeah. I saw a commercial for what I now know is Gunpla. Yes. Gunpla. Uh, yeah, that was, that was my only exposure to the Gundam, but I didn't know what Gundam <laughs> was. I just thought it was really cool looking robots. You know, it was transformers on steroids, I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever. But, uh, we're taking a look at these movies, discussing what we think about them, what our perspective is, and also drawing some encouragement out of it. So, uh, we're just excited to do that. What are we watching today? Mr. Mora. Today, Branson, we're taking a look at Mobile Suit Gundam 2, Soldiers of Sorrow, which is a 1981 film that summarizes episodes 16 through 30 of the series Mobile Suit Gundam from 1979. Wow. So, so the, the name of the movie is Soldiers of Sorrow. Right. Which I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of bummed that they didn't name the first movie. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That. Did the first movie have an official name? Uh, got them one. That that was it. That was it. That was, so that this was... this this one needed the subtitle, huh? I guess so. I mean, I that... appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> that gives me fear for what the subject is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel the well, need to call it a soldier of sorrow. Well, this is the this is the uh, the su the synopsis of it from the Gundam fandom page. 
the war between the Federation and Zeon, which by the way, Zeon, not Zeon, Z- Zenon. He kept kept saying Zenon last episode. We got hate mail about that. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, some go- dude named Daiku was calling up, and I was like, calm down, sir. Anyways, <laughs> so Federation and Zeon continues on Earth. Gundam pilot Armoro Ray begins to understand the true horror horrors of war after a deadly confrontation with Xeon ace pilot Rumba Rao and his suit goof. Um, <laughs> as, <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> goalie, as friends and comrades <laughs> fall in battle, Gorge <laughs> must find the will to overcome his sorrow and carry on. <laughs> in his war against Mickey Mouse. I have this image of a giant mechanical goofy walking across the lake. <laughs> and it's like falling apart and screws are falling out. <laughs> <You. laughs> yep. I'm sorry. Yep. I, That's what's goof. happening in this episode. I, all of the really cool words in the Japanese language and we're going to call it goof i'm probably mispronouncing it if i had to guess but that's it's the ms07 b goof did you goof Um, on goof are you goofing on goof right now (laughs) the the fandom page classifies as a mass production close quarters combat ground mobile suit also known as goof goof (laughs) i'm not gonna lie it's one of my favorites yeah Oh yeah, the the from what I remember of the first movie, the suit is awesome. That's the one with the electro whip, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The suit was amazing. I just such an unfortunate name. <laughs> <laughs> Golly. Oh my gosh, that's so What's funny. The, do, do you've seen this movie? Do they say "goof" in the movie? Like, is that a Japanese word for something, or is that what Americans translated it to? You know, I don't think that in the movie they actually name it. They probably do in a, in the series somewhere. Um, yeah. Again, this is condensed, but I I don't I don't remember. Uh, we will we will listen and find out. Okay, because I mean, if if there's like a Japanese word for goof to our American ears, that would sound cooler than goof. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is Raul's suit, right? Right. See, I like Raul. Why does he get the goofy suit? That, that <laughs> just okay. We're we're already starting at a negative for this movie. It, what is it goof? G O U F. How would you Galf? Galf. We're gonna go with Galf. Galf. Because that sounds better than goof. As long as it's not gout. <laughs> hey, speaking as someone who has suffered from gout, yes, I, I agree. Let's not do that. <laughs> it's still better than goof. <laughs> Galf. <laughs> right, it's the Galf. I don't know. Those of you who are listening who know better. Again, I'm not an expert, as Bryson keeps saying. Is it Galf? Let me know. Reach out to us. <laughs> the Gundam Watch on Facebook and Instagram. There you go. All right, Bryson. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions before we go into this? Uh, honestly, I just can't get goof out of my head right now. Uh, <laughs> let me think. Uh <laughs> I guess this will be answered when I actually watch the film, but does this pick up like immediately after movie one has time passed by? This like, is, it's going to, it's picking up basically right after movie one. If I remember okay. correctly, you're going to have a little summarization of movie one in this. So, okay. which will, that's a talking point for me about actually about the movie on the back end. So we'll talk about it. Okay. Sounds good. All right. All right. Well, for those of you who are new to the show, Branson and I are about to go into our individual viewing pods, and we're going to give our expectations about the movies, and then uh, we'll be right back to talk about them. Sounds good. Let's do it. All right. Movie two. Here I am in the viewing pod. Going to get some snacks today. Activate that. Whoa. What is this Q button? Let's see. (laughs) <laughs> it's a quesadilla menu. Haro, I love you. All right, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's a good flavor. Mm-hmm. And create. All right, while that's making, let's see. What do I expect in movie two? I expect... 
I think it would be good to explore the relationship between Fraubau and Amuro. Because there's definitely, well, there's tension there, at least from Fraubau. Amuro seems to starry-eyed over Lieutenant Matilda. But I think that's just a boyish phase. I would like that to be explored. I'm very curious about the relationship between Char and Salia, I think is her name, Salia. I want to learn more about that. I would like for the movie to explore more of the conflict between the two warring factions, between the Federation and Zeon. So that would be good to kind of get a little bit more background into exactly what's going on with that conflict. I'm also hoping that they did a pretty good job in the last movie, but I'm hoping that they will make Zeon even more relatable. I'm very intrigued by this whole concept of there not being a clear good guy, bad guy in the conflict. Um, yeah, I think that those are my expectations. I expect to be as thoroughly entertained by the second one as I was the first. So here we go. Looks like my quesadilla is almost done. Yes. Oh, mm, this is so good. Oh, okay. Okay. Pressing the play button now. All right. I'm loaded up into the pod. Tacos are ready to go. Ooh, quesadilla. Thank you, Haro, for installing the quesadilla machine into mine, too. You're the man. Robot person thing. I don't know what you are, but thank you. All right. So we're going into the second one. Mosu Gundam 2, Soldier of Sorrow. Whew. All right. Expectations going into this. I legitimately am still unsure. Again, my memory's foggy from the last time I watched this series. But with what took place last time with Garma dying and Char starting to show uh, just his manipulation of everything. I'm expecting a little bit more political play to take place, a little bit more uh, political theater, if you if you will. And I'm excited because Rambo Raw is going to be in this one, and I I legitimately like Rambo Raw. Like there's a there's a gentleman. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like he's just a gentleman. There's 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 something valorant about him, which is one of the things I love about the series, is because I feel like we're going to see a little bit more of the play on other sides of realizing not everybody on the quote unquote bad guy side are bad guys like there's gonna be a there's a blending of things and it's gonna get a little mucky and uh, I, I'm really interested to see how Amro uh, works through the emotions of everything because um, again he's a kid and he's experiencing this, this war in huge links so uh, that's my expectations let's let's fire this up and see what happens all right that ending ladies and gentlemen that ended up in a high point. I, I, I'm, I'll be okay in a second. Just, just give me a minute. Okay. You okay? I'm okay. It's, it Is was that? aptly named. It was, it was aptly named. It was sad. It was sad. Uh, There's a lot oh of two Wow. Is that I, cheese on your beard? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. I, 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 Eat my feelings when I get emotional. How many quesadillas did you eat? I stopped counting. Oh gosh! <laughs> what the hell are we stocking? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> might need to restock a lot. <laughs> oh man, All this right. uh, this one was heavy. Yeah, like really heavy. A mm-hmm. lot of a uh, lot of moments. A lot of moments. Yeah. This is the second act of the series as a whole, obviously. Um, and uh, in my experience with, uh, you know, you look at movies and shows and, and three acts. In my experience, the second act is where all the heavy stuff hits. Yeah. Uh, where the heaviness is. And so that's what this movie is. Like the heaviness really sits here. Um, and so we're, we're going to kind of walk through this together. Um I want to point out this one thing I appreciate about this film is that 
it doesn't presume that you've seen the first movie recently. It reminds yes. you of a few things. There was yeah. you, you mentioned this several times last last episode last month that it was such an information dump in Gundam One that um, you know you just kind of overloaded. So it was good to have this refresher of the just like okay, this is what took place. This is where I'm at. This is where we are as we go into the rest of the film. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciated that too. Uh, if nothing else, it told me the highlights. It mm -hmm. didn't spell out like every single little detail, right? But it reminded me of the really important po parts, so that when it picked up with the story, I remembered who the key people were. I remembered the situation, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so that was that. That, that I, I appreciated that. Uh, you know, it's like on shows where streaming shows where they have the skip the intro button or skip the recap button. I never skip that. Like I actually appreciate the recap, even if I'm binge watching something and I had just seen, <laughs> I had just seen the previous episode. I want that. Remind me again where we are. Okay. Right. Now we can move forward. Yeah, totally. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like, what's the word I'm looking for? It wasn't elongated till it was ridiculous. You know, there's some shows like right. they had the recap. Uh, I, I'm going to just call it out. So let's say I've been watching, um, bleach recently mm -hmm. and uh we're on like episode 213 214 i think right now and um but when you watch bleach you might as well just jump to the four minutes and 30 second marker because right about there is when the episode actually starts because before that it's wow. it's intro and then recap four minutes of recap base uh, well in at like two and a half minutes of, of a music video intro ah okay <laughs> That's a long <laughs> intro. It's yeah, it's it's a thing. Um great show. I love it, but yeah, yeah. Uh <laughs> so you use this, that skip intro button. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is I'm watching on Hulu, you can't skip it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it wasn't elongated, it wasn't like belated. We got right into it. Like I said, gave the highlights and it reminds yeah. you, like, oh yeah, like okay, the, you know, there was a colony drop. We're roughly 10 months into the one year war of everything. So, I mean, we're tracking along pretty yeah. quickly here. Mm -hmm. Reminded me of, uh, you know, like, like who Shar was mm -hmm. and his connection to the team. Uh, the fact that Omaro is the main pilot for the Gundam and that he's not always eager with that title. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's not always excited to be that. Yeah, uh, we see Garma, Garma's death, right? Uh, and and why that's that's vital. Uh, yeah, no, I, I thought it was a great recap. Just being completely transparent, the first like thirty seconds, I thought I had accidentally started the wrong movie. I thought I was watching movie one again. I paused it because I thought the same. <laughs> okay, like, okay good <laughs> am i on the wrong movie oh no we're on the right spot okay <laughs> i Pass feel better taco, now let's go <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> like it wasn't until we see the the ship drop on the the city because like the 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 phraseology slightly different the timing mm -hmm. slightly different at that point i was like okay no i'm pretty sure this is new but up right. until that point, I was like, oh, geez, I've started the wrong movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, again, the movie picks up and we are picking up with Rambo Rao and uh, and um, Amaro and they're in the desert and they're trying to figure some stuff out. Rao is on a mission. He's here to um, take out the white base. Mm -hmm. partly for just the general mission for uh, everything, but also in retaliation for the death of Garma. Right. And, um, and this kind of brings me to our first top point. We, we kind of touched on this last time. Rao is this kind of gentleman character. Oh man, and... I love him. That's great. <laughs> right? Like that, that spoiler alert guys, when he died, I was like, crap, right. That's not cool. And then his wife goes off and dies like just a few minutes afterward. And I was like, they, they were the people that I would hold up as examples of Xenon's, excuse me, said it wrong again. Xeon is not all evil people. 
Right. You know, you can't call Zeon the bad guy because they're not all bad guys. Right. The uh, the scene where Amaro's having his freakout moment and he's in the shop and they're talking about buying him dinner. And Rawl basically puts two and two together and says, yeah, this guy's totally from the Federation. He's probably one of their pilots. This is the enemy sitting here right in front of me. And instead of shooting him, instead of arresting him, instead of getting him, says, you know what? You're a good kid. You're very brave. I like that in a man. Go on about your business. Now, he follows them so he right. can find White Base, which is just good tactics. Right. But, I mean, that guy sat there. The enemy is right across from him. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't get mm-hmm. flustered. He treats the man with respect and honor. And I'm just think, like, wow. I think you would appreciate watching the actual episodes because there's more of a row and figuring out who he is. One of the things for me, as somebody who watched the series and watching this, there is a, a brevity of it. You're like, man, there's just so much more. Mm-hmm. So like as much as you were invested in a row, there's much more for you to be invested in him and his storyline in the series mm-hmm. itself. It reminds me of um, the great debate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you're familiar, are you familiar with the, um, the anime Full Metal Alchemist by any chance? I've heard of it. Yeah, I've not okay. seen any of it, but I've heard of it. There's two versions. There's Full Metal Alchemist. There's Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. And people kind of complain because Brotherhood shortened the original series. Uh-huh. You're like, man, you lose the emotions. I say no. I have some of the emotions. They were there. Where you lose the emotions was the movie where <laughs> the live action <laughs> movie where there was no emotion whatsoever throughout the entirety of the film. And this is what I want to point on. This movie that we we just watched that summarized so much still did a great job of evoking those emotions in you. Yeah. Of I respect absolutely. this as a gentleman's gentleman. Right. And, you know, his death. I, I feel like that when you're, again, it's so difficult to chop up stuff. Again, this is uh, episode 16 through 30. So that's like 16 episodes. Right. Compressed into two hours. This is shorter than the last movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. And yet it's a extra half hour long series is compressing into it. Mm-hmm. It's hard to pick what you want to cut out. Right. And yet they did a great job of making it so that it was brief, brief. But man, there's this emotion behind this this gentleman, Rambo Rao. Right. And just the the congeniality that he approaches his soldiers, his I mean, when when they're in the thing and they're sitting around and um uh, Miss Hammond basically decides that she likes Amaro. I guess she thought he was cute or something like that. Mm-hmm. And the soldiers are all sitting around saying, Hey, Miss Hammond thinks she likes you. That's, that's a big deal. You know, you ought to, <laughs> I mean, it, it didn't feel like a commanding officer with his subordinates. It, right. it felt like he was sitting amongst friends, actually, uh, Star Trek, strange new worlds. Uh, mm-hmm. I've, I've finished watching that. And one of the things I appreciate about that show is that Pike, when he's talking with his other officers, it's like, he's among a group of friends. It's a mm. camaraderie that, uh, they had in the next generation, Star Trek: The mm-hmm. Next Generation, and I got that same vibe, and I appreciate that. I appreciate, you know, they respect him as the superior officer. They do what mm-hmm. he says, but at the same time, they can sit around the dinner table yeah. and just chat it up with him. I remember uh, when I taught at a high school in Monroe, Louisiana. There was a math teacher that I worked with. His name was Al Cherry, and Al Cherry was amazing because in the math classroom. Is he a black Big man? Al. Yes. Big, Big Al. Al. Yeah. Big Al, the Al. rapper. Yeah. 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 He's great. He's great. Well, what was so cool about him is I guess part of it was because he, he grew up in the neighborhood where a lot of these kids were coming from. But in the math, cl- in the math classroom, he would teach them math. He would teach, he taught calculus and he would teach them stuff. And the kids would sit and listen. They would do their work. I mean, they respected him as a teacher, mm-hmm. but then when it came time for lunch, the rest of us were like, you know, we're teachers, we're on duty, that kind of thing. Al would get in line with the kids, mm-hmm. get a plate with the kids, sit down at the table with the kids and laugh and joke and cut up with them like he was one of the kids. Yeah. And that did absolutely nothing to undermine his authority in the classroom. When he went back to the classroom, they had that relationship and that respect with him that mm-hmm. they could joke around with him and relax around him. But when he said, okay, it's time to do math, they stepped to it and did what they needed to do. And right. I see that same thing in, in Raw. That, you know, he 
joked around with his his officers, but when he gave commands and orders, they did it. Exactly. And I I hated I hated 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 <laughs> seeing him die. Like I ah uh, you know <laughs> dang. Uh, to be fair, he is kind of the archetype character that you you gravitate towards. Yeah, that's but true. But they do a great, such a great job of telling the story, of bringing out this character. And again, this also kind of highlights our conversation we had last time, last month about the fact that this eliminates the idea that all characters are of the bad guy's side or the bad guy's side. It really right. boils down to you cannot go, okay, this is your flag. You are evil. You have to look at people. Because you, you also start seeing a lot of the... Uh, you see a little bit in the last movie, and you see a little bit more in this movie of maybe the Federation isn't all on the up, up and up, on the up and up. I mean, uh, they often are talking about the fact that they're using White Base as a decoy, a a ship with children, uh-huh. not just children who are commanding, but just children as yeah. decoys for the greater war. Right. Right. And so you yeah. have this. Huh? I think we even see that when. Uh when the soldiers attack white base mm-hmm. and they're landing on top of white base. And, and I remember that was a cool scene because it was one of the first fights that was actually man to man. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the mobile suits were involved. Yeah. But you also had ground troops. And I remember mm-hmm. thinking that was, you know, after seeing so much of the big white suit and the big <laughs> Zako suits, you know, to actually have a fight where no, it's just us and our pew pew guns. Right. That was neat. But there's a scene where one of the, Zeon soldiers is out a window and he looks mm-hmm. in and sees the children like the little kids yeah yeah. and he's like they have children on this ship and he's taken aback like oh my gosh what is this right they even mention it in the in the elevator he's like why are there kids here yeah and yeah and he's and like maybe he they're just the, shorthanded when he puts the plastique on the window he says get back get back this is about to blow up you're gonna get hurt right like, he's carrying out his orders but He's like, I don't want to hurt these children. Right. That's not the mark of a villain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that they're the antagonists, but villains don't care about, oh, I don't want to hurt the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's actually one of the things I wrote down was you see both sides of the war, Mm -hmm. Um, especially I'm going to butcher her name. Mirahu? Mirahu? Mirai? Mirai, the, the older sister that Kai kind of oh yeah, yeah, yeah i can't oh man it's mira who isn't it something like that i can't remember now yeah i'm i'm butchering her name but she's a spy for mm-hmm. zeon but the whole reason she's doing it is to feed her brother and sister because mom and dad are gone i think right. mom died i don't know where dad was in the picture but and, and, and what's crazy is kai sees her sneaking around the ship and immediately knows what she's doing there Mm -hmm. and he doesn't help her get the information, but he helps her hide. Yeah. Like for a second, I almost thought Kai was a traitor too. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, you know, does he work for Zeon? (laughs) No, he's just like, I know why you're here and I don't care. I want, you know, I know you're trying to take care of your, your baby sister, baby brother. So I'm going to hide you stay here. I think at one point he even says, don't do any intelligence gathering until after I'm gone. In those words, but pretty similar. Yeah. Says, <laughs> Don't sneak around the ship. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but, but I mean, you, you see those characters and you're like, and I think I touched on this last time, like when Garma dies, you see the head of the, the nation mourning. Mm-hmm. Again, Shar is really the only truly evil, or, or I won't even say truly evil, but like villainous character. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and, and again, normally I feel like that's a tired trope. I, I appreciate stories where the bad guy is the bad guy. Right. But maybe it's because this is, this isn't couched in, you know, hero versus villain, but it's, it's war mm-hmm. and the complexities of war. So you already have a very complex storyline. So it, it helps right. to have people on both sides that you can connect with and relate with. That mm-hmm. was another death that hit me hard i mean she's mm-hmm. helping kai and she goes down there to make the missiles launch and then she just floats away yeah and kai's like hey get up here what are you doing and i'm like oh this isn't gonna be good <laughs> i'm gonna point this out the with that moment i'm glad you brought that up because this series is really good at 
literally painting out traumatic moments in very beautiful style. Yeah. When she floats away, they do it in such a dramatic way that it's almost a beautiful still of itself, but right. it shows the the gravity of the moment itself. We saw that way back to the first, like in the first episode, uh, first movie, when there's that first explosion in front of Armoro at the uh, entrance to the, the underground bases. That, I mean, it's this massive explosion. It's beautifully drawn out, but it also is like, you're like, wow, this is, there's gravity to this. There's, there's, this is harsh. Yeah. And especially when they're all gathered around Kai and he's just sitting there crying. And the crazy thing is none of them knew who she was. Mm -hmm. They're like, I think she was his girlfriend, maybe. I don't know. You know, and he's just broken over it. Mm -hmm. And I, man, it's just, and that happened a lot in this movie. There was a lot of people that they either lose someone or someone dies. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> no. You know, I, I will admit there was one death that at first I was not affected by, but I was affected by later. Mm-hmm. Uh, going back to Lieutenant Matilda. Mm-hmm. Uh, she died. Right. And I was like, okay, that's sad. Yeah, that's, that's, that's sad. It, you know, she, she gave her life. I was really more upset about Ryu. Right. Than it was about Lieutenant Matilda. So I was like, okay, well, you know, now that she's out of the way, then maybe Armbro can stop needlessly being attracted to her and just move on with life. But then they make it to Jabaro. Mm. And he meets her fiance. Yeah. And he's all like, I'm going to dedicate myself to the protection of white base because that's what she would do. I'm like, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Gave you the feels. The, the one death I was okay with. And now you got to do that. Dang it. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, this was a heavy movie. It's just all kinds of stuff all over the place. <laughs> ah. It was. Again, and this is... This is one of the reasons you're discovering one of the reasons why I love this franchise is not every series, but a many of the series, there is a there's a pull. There's emotional strings that are grabbed hold. You're like, wow. Like I I you don't expect it in a in a show like this. Yeah. Um, you know, we're coming from a a Western mindset of a space, sci-fi, cartoons, and pew pew pew, and okay, cool. Right. But like, man, we're they're dealing with life yeah like major life issues are being taken place with this thing and um you know they're they're really struggling with some stuff um even like you have um saya sayla and she's she's dealing with the grips of like you know we're we're getting deep in the story like okay so her real name is um our our artesia and Uh charge's name is cassival and but and you find out like okay She's really mad that he's joined Zeon. Mm. And we don't know why. Like, why is he with Zeon? How did this happen? Right. What, and he's out to kill the zombies, apparently. But what's happening there? Yeah. Like, there's this there's this political intrigue that's taking place. But you also you well, see, see, like, and, the... And I thought that she was Zeon and either defected to the Federation or was... because Because when the Zeon invade White Base, she runs into a general that, like, knows who she is. Mm-hmm. And and uh like they, they have a conversation. So and then there again, there's a death. She like tries really hard to cover his escape so he can get away and he dies anyway. So I guess I thought that she was Zeon and de- not defected because she's using a false name, but like she switched sides. But so you're telling me she wasn't originally Zeon? Or, we will uh, discover more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> see, we will discover more as we go, Branson. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> yep. Crazy stuff. That's, this is again. This is where I, I, I love the series is because there's so much depth and um, there are things you're not gonna understand until we hit other series. Ah. Okay. <laughs> like it's kind of one of those like. They've built such a, a magnificent world. Or This is one reason why I suggest this as a first one thing for people 
is because it does hit it lays out the groundwork so many things that you can jump off with and they do Mm -hmm. and uh yeah so but you have this emotion she's like this is my brother and he's fighting with zeon and she's really Mm -hmm. upset about that and she's dealing with her own emotions hiding even who she is Mm -hmm. which um hmm? that that whole exchange did point into something that i think i mentioned last time that i appreciated the fact that the the (coughs) mobile suit gundam is not a sentient machine anyone Mm -hmm. can pilot it you really see that Mm -hmm. in this movie because sayla when she finds out her brother's over there, she's like, I got to make contact with him. So she jumps in the Gundam mm-hmm. and takes off. And so armor was like, okay, I guess I'll go get in the cannon, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which was a really cool scene where armor was almost like coaching her mm-hmm. while she's in the Gundam. Okay. You got to do this. You got to do this, you, you know, try this. But, uh, but it shows that the importance of all of the kids being interchangeable, mm-hmm. everybody needed to be able to pilot everything. Right now, they talked about how no one could pilot Gundam the way Armuro can. Right, and that gets kind of into that new type stuff. Right, which um, we'll talk about here in a little bit. Yeah, but I did appreciate that. I mean, if you have a warm body in the seat pushing buttons, the Gundam is going to do stuff. You know, there's <laughs> exactly. not this mystical connection. Right, and again, I I don't have a problem with that kind of storyline. I just I guess it's just based on what I'm drawn to. I see that a lot. Mm-hmm. So to see something that's purely mechanical. Right, I guess is is a nice change of pace, you know. And actually, uh, I I found out this when I was getting pre- doing some show prep. Um, in this cut, there are scenes that they cut out from the series, and they actually adjusted a few things to bring more realism. There was a there was a whole like switching back and forth of some equipment that was going to take place. They uh-huh. cut out because Tomino felt like it was too um, magical. Oh, it okay. wasn't grounded enough, and so he removed it for other things. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, that 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 definitely came through then. Yeah, because uh, I felt that. Uh, <clears throat> so you bring up the the gun cannon. Um, yeah. This is we highlight we were highlighted a lot more, uh, or this highlights a lot more of other machines that take place in the series. Um, last episode you saw more, or last movie you saw just basically Gundam Zaku, and then a little bit of the Ga- Galf Goof. um i don't know so but this one you see a little bit more of the gun cannon and -hmm. the gun tank which are um two other prototypes that were were produced um by side seven but then you also see a sneak peek at the end of what we call um in the fandom uh in the in the franchise the gm and gm is a it's a designation for basically uh mass-produced versions of gundam Mm -hmm. they're just basically general models they're not as powerful as gundam but they're basically like gundam and so we kind of see the first mass productions of those Mm -hmm. and then we also see and this is this is actually one of my complaints about the about this movie it introduces so many other machines but gives you no frame of references to what they are yeah which when you have a series that kind of is based around the various machines it's just kind of nice to have and they do it in the series, but the movie itself does not mention a lot of the names. I, I can, I can, I can connect with that because there were a lot of times that they were in suits and I was a few minutes into it before I realized that these aren't all just Zako suits, especially Zaku's. on the Zaku suits, excuse me, especially on the Xeon side, mm-hmm. because this is Xeon technology. I mean, I think one of the characters even talks about, you know, I've lost three suits in three battles. I right. want a shot at, at, uh, Jabiru, I think. Um, uh, but, but I, I felt that, that it seems like every time we turned around, they were jumping in another ship and another suit would come up and not all the suits looked like people. One mm-hmm. of the suits looked like a, a stingray or something. It was in the water. <laughs> yeah. That <laughs> was know? actually, that was a mobile armor, which is a, uh, a different classification. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I did feel kind of lost there. I think at one point my eyes just kind of glazed over and I was like (laughs) robots fighting. Wow. Well, like, okay. So like one of my favorite suits is the doms, which are the black suits that you see, uh, the, uh, armor was fighting. They took, uh, took out Matilda, um, which that actually kind of, that whole little blip right there kind of irked me because that was like a couple episodes where mm-hmm. these guys, they were they were big news. Like they were they were baddies. Like yeah. Um, 
there was some legitimate fear about these particular characters because they were skilled fighters. That whole like jet stream maneuver they did. Yeah. Those almost killed Amaro and the entire team at one point in time, basically. Wow. And so Amaro's ability to just take them out, it, it kind of removed some of the, the tension of the moment for me uh-huh. because I, I remember these things and I also remember the dubbing. One of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one of the characters name of those three guys was, Ortega. Uh-huh. Okay. There is a <laughs> there is a company called Ortega. Uh-huh. That makes taco paraphernalia, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they make taco shells and all this sort of stuff. And now when it all Or- comes together. <laughs> okay. So I, I'm I need you to walk with me. Okay. When Armro steps on the one guy's dom and jumps off. The Japanese, like I think he says something, or at least in the movie, they dubbed, they subtitled as him saying, uh, "He used me as a springboard." In the uh, in the anime in the American dubbing, the dude's got this country like uh, redneck accent. Yeah, and he's like, "Hey, did you just step on me?" And so, <laughs> so every time I'm in the store with celeste and i see the ortega stuff i go did you just step on me and celeste is like what i was like it's from gundam (laughs) (laughs) you gotta be there (laughs) so wow i was kind of sad that that wasn't in there but there for (laughs) real these characters were were ominous and um present Mm -hmm. and it was just a blip yeah really a very fast fight i mean yeah it had major repercussions but it did seem like it was over with quick Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but there's what's called a dom. The uh, the first aquatic ones that you saw, mm-hmm. those were called, and I'm going to butcher this. Uh, it's Z apostrophe G O K. So Zagok. Zagok. That sounds good. And yeah. then in the battle at Jaburo, the other ones you saw Shar fighting with, that was called a Gog. G O G G. And um, again, all these things are kind of thrown out there, and in the movie. You don't really have time to process it. Like you just kind of go, okay, robots. Yeah, right. And it does become a, a talking point later where there is a distinction between a mobile suit and a mobile armor. Um, and uh, in the third movie, you're going to see a pretty major mobile armor that armor has got, I think two even, that you're gonna, he's got the fight that are, they're menacing. Yeah. yeah. So what is the difference between armor and suit? Like what's the but, distinction? it seems to be a size classification like the are the okay. suit um it's it, it's like a suit it's humanoid mm-hmm. whereas the armor tends to be bigger almost ship-like mm-hmm. in a manner yeah. well yeah that, that i did notice that that some of the armors or some of the suits that they were piloting didn't look like a giant human it, it, right like i said one of them looked like a stingray and yeah. then that kind of thing so those are armors then yes okay cool so but yeah so um just there was just so much there at the time because they don't explain it because again they're they're compressing so much you do kind of go blind to it which i think Mm -hmm. it can hinder the storytelling um for those who are getting into it and again i'm not an expert but when you start to see the things and because then there's like renditions of them you see later like oh wow that was a rendition of this thing from beforehand Again, the this you can go as deep into this world as you want to with parallels and drawing things and like there there are people who have done rabbit hole dives of like mapping out all the way back to the first mobile there are these things called mobile balls. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's basically a ball with arms and a gun. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> the the fight in space. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. So um, I want to point out a humorous moment because this was so heavy of a thing. Whenever they're after the uh the spy or the guy the guy they captured from Rama Rao's team, yeah, and he locks himself in the airlock. Yeah, I think it's interesting that instead of going, "Hey, let's get the the pass key," my dude grabs a bazooka for the key. 
<laughs> and then acts shocked that there's a big hole. <laughs> I choose violence. <laughs> like, I'm glad you guys are dead. <laughs> well, I mean, it was effective. It I literally wrote down mode. bazooka key in my, <laughs> in my notes. And then Amro having yet another crisis, which... Yeah, I, I, I'm i guessing that in the stretched out episodes, it, it there's more of a buildup because it seemed a little out of the blue. Now, mm-hmm. now granted, I, I recognize that he's going through some stuff. The first mm-hmm. movie established that. This dude is, is having a hard time adjusting. Mm-hmm. But as you pointed out... um. <clears throat> He has these moments where he's like, okay, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this happen. And so his freak out seemed kind of out of nowhere. Right. And then when he has the freak out, he's burying the Gundam suit in sand. Thank you. Now, this thing is massive. Mm Mm-hmm. And when they show him burying it, he's literally kicking sand over the head. I'm like, okay, so what, is this like two weeks later that, that we see this? I, I, I literally mean, wrote down, how long did it take him to bury the Gundam? <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I guess he could like, you know, Miami Beach it while he was in the Gundam and just bury himself using the robot. <laughs> and then once he gets up to his head, eject. And then <laughs> jump. But, but even then, I mean, I just... That was a moment where I was like, okay, we're going to suspend reality for just yeah. a second. <laughs> my, my notes say that this was the Grand Theft Gundam moment. <laughs> <laughs> He's just it, like, hey, you know, Sayla stole it. I can steal it too, but exactly. I'm going to keep it this time, you know. Now, I, I kind of get his frustration, this freak out moment to the degree because, and again, you miss some of it because the way they cut it for the movie, but he spent time really struggling with the last words they heard from uh, Ramba Rao, which is you only won this fight because of the Gundam's abilities, because of the Gundam abilities, like, Mm -hmm. and like, he's trying to figure out what, like he, he's, he's been trying to figure it out and he's gotten to the point where he's, and he says it right there, right before everything goes weird, that there really is no, a lot of difference. There's not a lot of difference between his Gundam and the, or the goof. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> it's a matter of the pilot. Right. And so he um, falls asleep. And so he's, he's intentional about trying to become a better pilot because he's told you need to become better at this. You need mm-hmm. to take care of this and become better. And then he overhears, we got to take this away from him. Yeah. You know? And uh, so he has this kind of freak out and runs away moment. Yeah. But then he buries the Gundam. Yeah. And, and I guess if there was more build up. Mm-hmm. That would make sense, which I didn't understand why they felt the need to take it away from him. They 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 suspected that he was a new type, mm-hmm. which to me would suggest, no, he needs to be in the Gundam because he has an edge on everybody else. So I don't understand Bright's reasoning on taking the, the suit away. If they Some thought of it he boils was down to the, the fact that they cut so much. There is a cockiness that's building up within Amro that he has to take care of it. It's all him. Mm-hmm. He's the only one who can do this. He's the only one who has the ability, period, to pilot the Gundam. It's, um, it's the, we kind of talked about this last month about the whole um, being men and relying on other people. Yeah. Um, and it's the whole... Nobody else can do this as good as me, so it's mine. Uh-huh. And that was putting people in danger, that mindset. I and see. it was putting him in danger because he had mental breakdowns. He's having, like, yeah. he's, he, you saw him where, like, he wasn't sleeping because he was so focused on making it better. Right. And so that's why he was like, he's like, I got to take this away from him or mm-hmm. it's not going to be good. Okay. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Can, can we take a second to talk about? the new types for a second. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, I said last, last month that one of the things I appreciated was that there wasn't a chosen one vibe Mm -hmm. that it was very much a armor. pilot of the Gundam just because he was in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And now we introduce this idea of new types. Yes. On the one hand, I like the way they handle it in that, not everyone actually believes that new types are even a thing. 
Mm -hmm. It's this fringe experimental idea that they're kind of toying with. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a neat take. At the same time, making Armoro a new type cheapens, to me, cheapens how good he is as a pilot. Because up until that point, I was like, he's that good of a pilot because he's that smart. He can study. You know, he, he puts forth the effort and, and he becomes that kind of a pilot. Mm-hmm. Now they're suggesting that he's like the next evolutionary stage in human development. So it's less about he's just that good and more about, well, genetically, he's better. Isn't and that the same thing? The The difference is, and I guess this kind of harkens back to um, a conversation we had, you remember the, uh, the episode of Com talk where we talked about a superhero mm-hmm. and John said that to him, a superhero has to be someone that what makes them super is something that other people couldn't copy. Mm-hmm. Like he said, for example, um, uh, Iron Man wouldn't be a superhero because he has money mm-hmm. and anyone with money and the right, you know, development team could build an Iron Man suit. Mm -hmm. for me the difference is before armoro was good but it was something that other people could achieve like for example when uh sayla jumps in the gundam and just takes off Mm -hmm. she's not very skilled at it but the idea that i had is she's not very skilled at it because that's her first time in the cockpit she Mm -hmm. doesn't know how the controls work right by making Armoro a new type, it's, well, even if she knew exactly how the controls work, she'd still be awkward. Whereas Armoro, instead of it being, well, I'm good at this because I put forth the effort, I study, I, I read the manual, you know. Right. It's, well, you know, I'm just genetically better. I, well, I, it, it's not a same huge time, difference. It, I'm really struggling to find a difference because the suggestion is there are many other people who could do this mm. because they too are night new types. In fact, the suggestion was that uh Celio was a new type. Well, yeah, I, I got that later. I'm talking about in that point in the movie. Yeah. Before, yeah. Cause she went to the special Academy or whatever. Right. Well, they were, they were testing them all. Oh, the entire, okay, yeah. They're testing the entire crew. Yeah. But yeah. So, but so with new types, again, it's a matter of, this was a, a fundamental teaching of Zion Daiku, which was that, People living in space, by nature of space being what it is, there's no, uh, he would say there's no gravity to hold us down as people, Ah, would develop extra central sensory abilities Mm -hmm. because there's no pole. There's no, no, and so with there not being no poles, your body has to go, where am I? Uh huh. Like it's, it's like the old joke about like, why do why do all the ships in Star Trek come from the same angle? <laughs> well, the short answer is because the model had all the wires and stuff exposed <laughs> on the other side. Right. And we don't want to see that. So, <laughs> you know, that's so, the short answer. Right? I'm sure there's a story answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the it's the whole aspect of there's no up, down, left or right. Mm. So therefore. In, in this world, people had to discover, had they had to change. They had to learn how to see things and be more intuitive. Now, it does progress to a whole nother level down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a, in the, it's either the next series or the series afterwards that are in sequential order. There's uh, Zeta and then double Zeta, which... We're not going to hit those for a very long time, if I had to guess. Um, they introduced the concept of cyber new types, where people are artificially made into a new type. Okay. So, again, it's not a matter. It's, at the moment, yeah, it's super rare mm-hmm. because we're just now just we're, – we're only 75 years into people living in space. Okay. See, I'm, I missed the part where what was causing it was specifically living in space. Right. I, so I, I, I thought that, this was like a mutant uh, X factor gene type thing. Like they were, they were describing the mobile suit Gundam version of X-Men. Yeah. So in when one of the scenes when they're talking about, it might've been, uh, it, I don't remember if it was before Matilda died or afterwards, 
but they're sitting there talking about going to job row for the testing for the new type testing yeah. she keep it uh, until it was alive because she kept talking about the new type stuff but they explained that this was a teaching of Zeon Daiku that man would eventually be able to evolve because of where they where they live yeah into new types and they kind of drop pieces of this all over throughout the episode i've probably given you more information than what this movie has given us and there'll be more given to you in the next movie and there will be a lot more given to you in our next series that we cover okay um but that's kind of what's happening here that makes that a little bit better than the idea that well the reason he's this way is because he's lived in space and his body is adapted to because because that makes sense is that there's no pole so right. your body has to be spatially aware some other way and in so doing it makes him uniquely qualified to pilot the gundam because he's able to be aware right that that, that takes that takes the chosen one aspect out of it so i i i, I see where you're coming from with that yeah and, and so, again this is probably because everything's condensed and <laughs> you know well again it's it's one of those things that they sprinkle throughout to build up to it. So uh, like, um, and this won't, I don't know if this will make much sense to you at all. Um, when you and I were living through the early two thousands, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Good um, times. <laughs> I know you weren't into anime back then, mm-hmm. but for those of us who were watching Toonami, watching anime, we kept hearing stories about this thing called super Saiyan. Uh-huh. And we were, we're like, what is this? What does this look like? And then finally we saw it happen after 6,000 episodes. And <laughs> we're like, holy crap. And then we heard stories about Super Saiyan level two and three. And there was these, there, there was, and, but we didn't have information. They were just dropped mm-hmm. little bits at a time all the way throughout the franchise. It wasn't until like, like season three, season two. Yeah. Season three of, of Dragon Ball. That we got the payoff of the first words of, of from season one about Super Saiyans. Ah, okay. And so it's kind of like that situation. There's stuff dropped off a little bit where we're you're discovering this greater world of like, what is a new type? What does this look mm-hmm. like? How is this? Who are these people? And what exactly makes a new type a new type? And it gets it gets really interesting. Uh, the further we get into uh, this series Mm -hmm. but also in the franchise as a whole uh you start getting into things called um psycho gundams that have gundams which have a psycho frame which resonates with psych psychic abilities um Uh, and which is connected to new type technology and just like it it gets big it gets it gets really really intense cool cool so Hopefully that answered your questions. Yeah, yeah, no, that that does. And like I said, that that explains it a little bit better that it's not it's more because he was raised in space and less because he's just special. Mm-hmm. It was it was the fact that he was raised in space that made him special. Right. Um there was one really cool quote that I wrote down. Mm-hmm. Um and it was uh it was shortly after Amaro had his freak out and stole the mobile suit Gundam. They had white base parked and they were repairing it. And uh, I think it was Ryu. I think it was Ryu. It may not have been. I don't, I don't remember who it was, but they said uh, Bright was complaining about how Amuro just took off. He said, when he gets back, I'm putting him in the brig because he keeps breaking military re- regulations. And one of the guys says, these are last minute recruits and you keep talking about regulations. Yeah. So, so again, it, 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 it paints back to these are kids. Right. Bright is doing his best to operate this ship like it's a military institution. But at the end of the day, these are still children. Yeah. And every once in a while, people kind of have to remind Bright because Bright's one of the few people that's truly a soldier, mm-hmm. you know, that was left over from the big fight. Everyone else is, they were just there. They put right. on a uniform because they've got one, but yeah, that doesn't mean they're soldiers. <laughs> and Bright kind of has to be reminded every once in a while these aren't soldiers. Mm-hmm. These are children. They're having a hard time. You can talk about military regulations all you want. These kids weren't raised in that. Right. And, and I appreciated that the guy, and I want to say it was Ryu that, that did it, but I, I don't know. Yeah, for it sure. was. It, okay. Yeah. He takes the time to say, look, you can talk about military regulations all you want. These are kids. <clears throat> they didn't ask to be here. 
They right. didn't sign up to be here. They were thrown in here and had the fortunate position of surviving an, an attack. Right. And they've been conscripted into the army, some of them against their will, mm-hmm. they, because they just don't have any other option. So right. pump the brakes on the military regulation stuff. <laughs> and I, I appreciated that someone took the time to tell Bright that. Right. You know, remind him that just because you're playing soldier doesn't mean that everyone else is. Right. So if I were to break this into a familiar, familiar type of thing, Ryu is kind of like the, the caring uncle who's like on the outside going, Hey, look, slow down. Yeah. Bright is the, um, the new father, I would say mm-hmm. kind of an adopted stepfather who's just trying to figure out things. And then Mirai is kind of the mother of the group. Uh huh. I can, so, I can see that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially with the younger kids. Like she seems like she's, she holds herself personally responsible for all those small children. Mm-hmm. It's always either her or Frau that's kind of mm-hmm. corralling them and, and helping them out. Right. And let's, let's not forget, this is 1970s uh, landscape. I mean, yeah. Um, women were not in J- women in Japan period are not seen as, as people of prominent power, but especially in the seventies. In fact, interesting story. Um, people are freaking out and really excited about the new Gundam series coming out very shortly. I've called, seen uh, advertisements for that. Yeah. The witch of Mercury. And one of uh-huh. the things people are excited about is this is the first time that the lead protagonist is a female. Oh, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Now in the grand scheme of things, does this series fall in? after everything else we're going to look at or is it its own branch or i want to say this is a different universe altogether oh wow okay yeah. <laughs> cool cool i'm going to look it up while we talk <laughs> All right, yeah. i liked what you said about ryu being like the the chill uncle who tries to remind everyone to 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 you know take a break and relax a little bit which makes his death that much more heart wrenching because the thing yeah. is he was injured in the attack. Right. So he's laid up in bed and he's watching all the fight fights happening on the view screen. And he like gets up, forces himself into a, what, what was he piloting a fighter? Yeah. A core fighter. Yeah. A core fighter. And is like, no, I'm going to help my friends. I'm not going to sit here and be wounded and it's just, you know, that, that gumption, that, that go get him this to, you know, I don't care if I'm wounded, I'm going to go fight. And it was rewarded with death. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, ah, ah, so much death. All right. So back to your, your question about, uh, which yeah. Mercury It's going to take place in the universe called, uh, ad Stel- Stella A S, which is a completely new, um, universe completely new timeline uh i did hear one person re- uh, say basically it's a world where you have space amazon and space walmart at war <laughs> well now i'm even more intrigued <laughs> <laughs> team amazon <laughs> <clears throat> oh, goodness. so but yeah so um I think that's, I think we've talked this thing out, man. I think Any so. final thoughts? Uh, like I said, it was aptly named. Yeah. The, these so were, much emotions to this one. Yeah. A lot of soldiers who had a lot of sorrows. <laughs> um, I am, I'm eager to see the third movie for different reasons this time. Mm-hmm. The first movie, I was eager to see the second movie because I was eager to see how the story progressed. Mm-hmm. Now I'm eager to see the third movie because I just want all of this death and destruction to have a purpose. Mm. Show me the end game. <laughs> right. So that you know, I can feel good again. Don't get me wrong. I'm I'm still thoroughly entertained. Uh, and the writing of this movie was very, very good because it did cause me to feel so many emotions. Mm-hmm. And based on what you've told me, if I'd have watched it episode by episode, it would have been even more so. Mm-hmm. Um, honestly, I felt a little bit emotionally exhausted <laughs> after this one. Like, you know, I I just kind of want to eat some chocolate and put on some happy music and 
you know, get out of Drift my dark away. head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for, for, for a little bit, you know, I get it. I get it. Uh, so I will say this from my understanding, I've heard that Tomino dealt with his own demons. He, uh, he uh, dealt with some depression and stuff like that. In fact, you see that, um, in Zeta, it's super dark and super depressing. And it really was kind of Tomino expressing himself. And so you yeah. can kind of see some of that taking place here. Mm. So for me, um, I'm with you, man. This is just a, an emotional pull and, um, so much taking place. And, um, I like you, I want to get to the third movie because you want to see the payout. You want to see yeah. where this leads to, you want to see, you know, how are they going to survive this? Is there an end to this thing? Uh, um, mm. they haven't said it in this, but I keep calling it the one year war because mm. this is the, that's what they call it, this time frame, the one year war. Uh -huh. And, um, this again, it sets up for so many big things. Um, and I want you to be able to see how this ends because there's some iconic scenes in there that, um, that people replicate often because they're just, they're intense. And in this next movie is going to talk about some, uh, again, some intense subject matter and some mm -hmm. really some thought provoking stuff. So yeah. I'm excited for us to get into the third one. So, all right. Well, guys, that's our thoughts. We want to encourage you guys to check it out. Did you guys like it? Let us know. We're now going to go to our next session called The Maintenance Report. Now loading the cruise maintenance reports. Reports begin in three, two, one. All right. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are now present for our maintenance report uh this is the portion of the show where we take a look at gundam the movie we just watched or the show we just watched depending on what's going on and we go how how can we grow from this what, what's some stuff about this that can inspire us especially something that was so depressing like today yes so <laughs> i want to start off uh this this week actually in my deals with uh similar to what you talked about branson about not doing everything on your own and um because we see that we see amro and he's like i have to do this this is all me this is all my own thing and the lesson that bright's trying to get across to him is like look man there are other people here yes you're important but you're not the end all and that's a that's a that sounds harsh but when you get that understanding that there are other people involved in the process whatever you're doing in life there is things that come off of us that when your duty is no longer such a burden, when you understand there's a team of people working around you, I think about the scriptures where it talks about how, um, about, um, everyone being part of the body and, you know, not everybody can be a hand, not everybody can be a foot, not everybody can be a toe, but when everyone works in their own process, when they're one thing or another, the body functions correctly. And when one person is hurting, the whole body is hurting. When Amuro was down, the entire team was down. Um, literally, they were missing a third of their fighting force because they didn't have uh, the gun there. Mm -hmm. And the other portions were damaged. And so they needed everybody on deck. And it's so important for us to recognize we're part of a team and we need to be able to work with other people and uh, be healthy where we're at so that when somebody else is hurting, we can help them. And when we're hurting, they can be there for us. But we have to be able to recognize we're not the end all. We need people in our lives. It is so, so important. Uh, I've said several times over the last month and a half, really, uh, for geek devotions as a whole, that I am so thankful to have a team. Um, you know, Branson, you're on you're on a couple of my teams. You're a writer, you're a writer, you're a podcaster for two different teams. Now this team right here, we have other podcasters, we have other people who are doing stuff, helping create content to help people know that they're loved through Geek Devotions. I could not do what I do um, without you guys, and I appreciate you guys, and it has kept me alive. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's my uh, maintenance report. Very cool. Very cool. We are all very excited to be on the team with you. <laughs> if, if nothing else than just, and, I, and I've said this before, and, and I mentioned this to you back when you first brought the idea of geek devotions to me is this is an entire people group that mm -hmm. for the longest time was just unreached. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was, it was th- this assumption that, oh, those people that are into anime or manga or comics or whatever, that that's, those are those people. And there wasn't a, a concerted specific effort to reach them through those mediums. And then here you come along with geek devotions. And I mean, not only has, has our community here grown in geek devotions, but it's also connected us with other communities that are trying to do the exact same thing, mm-hmm. uh, it, which broadens our own community. You know, I know we've got a lot of friends that like geeks under grace, uh, retro rewind podcast, uh, villains and victims, Villains and Victims podcast. Um, victims and Villains podcast. Victims and Villains. See, I can't even get the name right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, a lot of people who are doing the same thing. They're they're using these pop culture things, these things that we all think are cool, and reaching them out and using that as a platform to share the love of Jesus with people. Yeah. And uh, so we're. I mean, I'm excited that that I get to be a part of it. Uh, if, if nothing else to be exposed to really cool new shows, and <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, um, for my maintenance report, I want to go back and, and spend some time talking about Kai and Mira, who I feel like I'm still butchering her name and I apologize. <laughs> uh, but I want to talk about the fact that he knew she was a spy. Yeah. Knew exactly what she was there for and still made it a point to show love to her yeah. to, to, you know, to hide her so that she wouldn't get in trouble. Mm-hmm. He didn't enable her to go spying. He didn't say, Oh, here, here's the password to all of my secrets, you know, but he made it a point to hide her. He made it a point to get her on the plane when they left. And that reminds me of stories like uh, the good Samaritan, you know, uh, the good Samaritan sees the guy beat up on the street yeah. and he sees his humanity. He sees that this is someone who needs my help. Now a Samaritan would have had every justification in saying, I'm not helping that guy because Samaritans were despised. Yeah. You know, the, the guy that was beaten up in the, in the road was a Jew. So to, for him to stoop down, to help him, to take care of him, to clean his wounds, to take him to an end where he'd be nursed back to health. That was doing a whole lot of stuff that was not deserved because Jews were not kind to Samaritans. Right. Uh, But he did it anyway. And we see that in Kai. And that's convicting for me because it's very easy for me to be kind to those who are kind to me. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for me to be kind to those who agree with me, uh, religiously, politically, whatever. But as a follower of Christ, we're called to have that same kindness and that same love to people that disagree with us or to people yeah. that are outside of our faith or people that outright hate us. You know, uh, we don't, we're not called to be nice to people who are nice to us. We're called to love everyone. Exactly. Even the people that hate us. And I think Kai modeled that in that he saw Mira Hu's humanity. Mm-hmm. Yes. She was technically an agent for the enemy. But he saw her trying to take care of her little brother and sister, Mm. saw her trying to be an adult. Again, a kid thrust into an adult situation where she's got to be the mom. Yeah. You know, and and instead of condemning her for being part of the Zeon Nation, condemning her for being a spy, she helps him. I mean, he helps her. Mm -hmm. And as a result, she turns her life around. She says, "Okay, well. You know, I'm sorry. I, this is all my fault that you are fighting this battle. Let me help you. Let yeah. me do something. So he, she, she kind of says, I, I'm going to help you. So tell me what to do. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's telling and very convicting on my part to be able to show that kind of love to people who are quote unquote, my enemies. Yeah. Yeah. So good, man. So good. Ooh, man. Lots of deep conversation today. Yes. A lot of heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hey, guys, if you enjoy this podcast, we would encourage you to uh, connect with us. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. Just look for The Gundam Watch. And uh, hey, Bryce and I want to hear from you guys. What did you guys think of the episode? What did you guys think of the movie, too? What did you think of our, of our maintenance reports? How they encouraged you? How they challenged you? Do you have a maintenance report of your own from these movies? We legitimately love hearing these things. Uh, Bryson, is there anything you want people to know about you? 
Uh, well, I enjoy long walks to the beach. And all- <laughs> no, kid, right? Sorry, he has allergies. He doesn't like beaches. <laughs> right, do that, do that. <laughs> no, uh, when I'm not watching Mobile Suit Gundam and geeking out on a potentially new fandom that I have, I have a small corner of Com Talk called BGs and Reviews, where I rate and review faith-based, family-friendly comics, and I also promote the creators that make them. So if you have a faith-based, family-friendly comic that you would like for me to review on my show, or if you are a creator who makes faith-based, family-friendly comics, and you want to come on my show and talk about your product, uh, email me at branson.boykin at gmail.com. I'd love to have you on the show. Uh, I also have a an audio drama dropping in September called Gospel by Gaslight that I'm very excited about. A lot of a lot of my friends are working with me, including Mr. Mora himself. He's going to be voicing a couple of people on the show. Uh, but it's a it's something that I've had in the works for a while. And through some prodding by some very dear friends, I'm finally putting rubber to the road and making it. So Awesome. Very cool. Well, guys, uh, if you want to check out more, again, of, uh, of me, go to geekdevotions.com, final information. Hey, I want to say one final thing. I want to say a special thank you to John Haru, who wrote our theme song. Our theme song is by John Th- uh, by John Haru, and we're using it with his permission. And, uh, John, you are an absolute rock star. Yes. Until next time. He actually is one. Him. Like He, is like he actually rock is a rock star. He's in a band. Like, he's <laughs> plays the guitar and everything. He is a literal <laughs> rock star. It's a true story. All right, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay devoted. Peace and love.